Would you uh, open your Bibles with me? Open your Bibles with me. Let's go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter number two may not mean a lot to you, but I grew up in the kind of church environment where we spent a lot of time in the book of Acts, especially the second chapter. Uh huh. It was like every Sunday we was in Acts 2. But I've been in a series the last few weeks titled Heart for the House. And in this series, we are, we are exploring the church's purpose, mission, and function as it is outlined for us in Scripture. Last week, I introduced the idea of the church being a table. Y'all remember that? The church is a table. And in keeping with that theme, uh, I, I want to take us to a portion of Scripture that outlines what I would call table manners for the church. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Table manners? Some of you are like, manners? Table manners? There's this thing called table manners, and that's the subject I want to preach to you from. But let's go to Acts chapter number 2, beginning at verse number 42. Here's what it says. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. I love this last part. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. I pray that you give us the kind of message that is uh, simple enough to understand, clear enough to be retained, but yet so profound because it is your word and not ours. Speak to us till it changes us to our very core. Help us to be your church, your people, your people triumphant, your people who walk in victory. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Table manners. We had the, the privilege this Friday to uh, spend some time with a couple who, um, who was a part of our church, and on Friday they got married. And uh, if you didn't know, Courtney and Rose, who are not here today, obviously, uh, they, were, they were joined together in, in marriage on Friday, and some of the folks here got an opportunity to be a part of that, and it was a beautiful night. Uh, and if you know anything about Courtney and Rose, these two are, they're sharp. They're just sharp people. You know, when they dress, they're just, oh, on a regular Sunday, you see Rose, Rose gets out of bed and she's dressed. Okay? That's just, the, you know, you ever meet those people, they just, they're just always dressed well. And that's them. So we kind of expected this was going to be uh, an over-the-top, come on, anyone who went knew, you were like, Lord Jesus, I got to buy something really nice. Because you just know the type of people these, you know. Like, there was no sweatsuit. You couldn't wear a sweatsuit. You, like, had to be right. And uh, so we got ourselves ready. And, and uh, the truth is, and this is between my wife and I. She's back there. We, I told her I was going to share this, so I'm not going to get in trouble for this one. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's always good when you get, like, permission beforehand. So here's permission. I said, I said honey, I'm going to tell that story about Friday. So Tammy and I were getting ready for this wedding, and we've got five kids to care for as well. And we got to get ourselves ready. So there was no time to get ourselves ready, get the sitter right, get out the door, drive the two hours it was going to take to get there, and get anything to eat that day. So we, by the time we got to the wedding, we were starving. Come on, somebody. Anybody ever go to a wedding starving? I mean, I was like hungry, hungry. Like, like looking at people like, man, he kind of looks like a sandwich. <laughs> I mean, so hungry, y'all. I was so hungry. And, and, and then, I, you know, I got there, and I, you know, I, I was helping to officiate, and, and I got in the running, and, and it, was, it was like this mad rush, and I forgot that I was hungry on top of having to do all that other stuff. And then, uh, so 
this place was beautiful. This venue was, it was, it was ex exquisite. That's the kind of word you got to use for that. I got to give you some real good adjectives for this place. I mean, there was like marble everywhere and columns and gold, and it was beautiful. And I'm looking, and I'm, I'm telling my wife, like, this food is going to be good. And I'm excited about it. And she says, oh, they got a cocktail hour, and they're, they're going to have a bunch of hors d'oeuvres. Well, we got into that area. Y'all, that was like a meal. And they had like, some of y'all that went, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm like walking around, I'm like, they got skirt steak right there. They got shrimp over there. And my wife reminds me, because we've been to, you know, a lot of years of pastoring, you go to a lot of weddings, and we, you, what you learn about these formal meals is they don't give you much to eat at the dinner time. How many of you have ever had a formal meal and you're like, where's the meal at? It'd be like a small little spoonful of potatoes, two green beans. <laughs> so my wife says, she says, you better fill up on these appetizers. <laughs> That's why she's my wife. She was looking out. She said, hon, you better eat as much as you can because they're not going to give us nothing when we get upstairs. <laughs> and then she said on top of that, oh, I love my wife. She said this. She goes, and you can't even eat the way you normally eat because you're all dressed up and you know when you're at your house and you're eating with just the people you call family, you don't care if you got grease on your cheek. Oh, don't y'all leave me by myself. You know what I'm talking about. You're just sitting there just throwing it back. I couldn't throw nothing back. I got to be like... You know what I'm saying, y'all. When it's like your house, that's why I like, I like to eat in my house. Because I'm going to eat the way I want to eat. And I'm not, I don't care what you say because you're not there. But at the wedding. So anyway, so we're getting ourselves ready. But here's the funny part. Uh, give me that first picture that I have. You ever get to a dinner and that happens? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Table manners, y'all. How many of you got to the dinner and honestly you're like, I don't even know what to do. Which one should I use? Is it the big one? Is it, see, you can take a picture of this. Next time you go somewhere, you can act like you know something. <laughs> see, this is a formal table setup. And they have extra forks and spoons, and they all have their purpose. And you put the wine glass here, and the water glass here, and this glass. And, and, and you ever been to the table, you're like, which one's mine? And here, if you don't know, there's actually a, there's some rules, there's some ways you're supposed to eat. There's a set way to eat at a table. There's this funny story of a preacher who has he had very little education. The Lord raised him up, did a great work in his life, and he got invited to the White House. And he got to the White House, and he's at the White House. This is this kind of dining at the White House. And he's looking around, trying to watch everybody else eat, and he says... One of the waiters or uh, of butlers, I'm not sure what they were, their title officially, that was there serving the table would walk up to him during a specific time of the dinner and tap where he was supposed to grab. <laughs> and I always have that picture in my mind because sometimes you'll find yourself at a table that you're not even prepared for. And I find that a lot of people join the church and don't understand the table they're sitting at. Don't understand that there are some things, some table manners that are necessary for the table to function the right way. If you don't grab the glass to the right of you, you're going to be drinking from somebody else's glass. Am, am I preaching good now? This is important stuff. So it's important for us to understand the table manners as it pertains to the kingdom of God. The book of Acts, the second chapter, it kind of outlines and gives us a historical outline of the birthing of the church. You see the church being birthed in that moment. The spirit of God falls. Supernatural things begin to happen. The gospel is preached and 3,000 souls are added to the church in one day. I mean, it is massive growth overnight. They seriously have parking problems. Some of y'all caught that. There's another bus coming in three minutes. <laughs> but they're, have, they're, they're in the midst of growth. They're in the midst of the, the, the starting of a brand new community. 
And what you read in, in Acts, the second chapter, especially as you get towards the end of the chapter, is you start hearing about what they were doing and how God was using what they were doing to build his church. So I want to get into these table manners that, I'm, that we found written in this particular passage of Scripture. And here's the first thing I want you to know about this particular table, the table of God. And that is that we learn at this table. Here's a table manner. We learn at this table. Where are you getting that from? All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles were teaching what? They were teaching what Jesus taught them. They were fulfilling the great commission that said, go ye into all the world. Right? We have to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to what? Observe all the things I've commanded you. So what they were doing was taking their firsthand experience, offering it to the disciples, and saying, hey, at this table we learn. What I want you to know about the table of the Lord, the table we call the church, whether it's the big C church or the little C church, if we call it journey church or whatever church, churches are a place where you should be learning. It's a table manner. As a matter of fact, it is disrespectful to sit at the table of God and not learn. Did y'all hear that? It's like going to your, oh, I, got, I keep going to my Puerto Rican people because I just think about our culture when it comes to food. How many of you come from that culture and you know that when they offer you food, you better eat? Come on. That might not just be Puerto Rican culture. That's everywhere, I guess. But I know you would offend somebody. you would be like, I just ate. Well, you're going to eat again. How many have one of those grandmothers, they would ask you if you wanted a plate while they were fixing your plate? I'm like, wait a minute, you answered for me. Why did you even ask? And don't you not eat? If you don't eat, it's going to be a major problem. Because it was disrespectful to come to that table and not eat. I'm telling you, church, it is disrespectful to be a part of the church and to not learn. To not be building. And this is why I wanted to challenge you over the next few weeks that I'm not preaching inspiration. I am, I am teaching this, time, this season. Because you got to learn how to, to how to eat food that doesn't just make you fly, but actually food that gives weight to your feet and stabilizes you and firms you up in faith. And the house of God is exactly that. If you turn off whatever's, if you if you forbid to, or, or decide not to eat what's being served because it doesn't feel inspirational, you're going to miss out on the food that is most nutritional for you spiritually. This is easy to be like, well, he's not really digging at my emotions. I'm not. I'm trying to get you to, I'm trying to get your head to get in line with God's word. Because if we get our head in line with God's word, we probably won't be so emotional. I'm preaching some good word there. We probably wouldn't be so driven by our emotions if we allowed the word of God to come in and wash our mind, clear our mind, sear our mind, so that we will align ourselves with his truth. So at this table, we learn. We're going to learn here. here here's the next thing. I'm going to go on. We gather at this table. Yes, amen. We gather at this table. Let's read the text. Let's go on. They committed themselves to what the apostles teaching and to fellowship. You cannot be a, 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 you know, a Christian that just has no connection with other Christians. It's never been the way of our faith. Our faith has always been one where we are connected to one another. And I know some of you have some serious wounds that you've experienced in life through Christian people, through church folk. But I'm going to tell you this, that's still not an excuse to not be in fellowship with people. Because how many of you know that while there are some bad people out there, there are some incredible people out there as well that will be a blessing to your life? And I, I want to drive this point because I find that we have, we worship with some people and then we hang with other people. And the problem is the Bible says what communion does light have with darkness? We will worship with people of light and then hang with people of the darkness. And wonder why there is this conflict between, listen, you can't be with people of the dark the majority of your time and not be influenced by their darkness. 
There is a fellowship component to Christianity that exists so that iron can sharpen iron. There, it is necessary that we be at the table together because God understands the influence of the world and its impact on the human soul. He says, I want you to be around people who will fill you up, people who will build you up. Because if, if you leave it to yourself, you'll run with people who make you feel comfortable in your mess. Get me at a table where someone will say, get your elbows off the table. Get me at a table and say, hey, you going to eat that? The rest of us ate our broccoli. You're going to eat it too. So important for us to understand that we gather at this table. That's why you got to come to church. No, I, didn't, I didn't make a judgment on your salvation. I didn't say you're going to, you're going to that other place. I didn't say that. All I said was that you got to be in fellowship with the saints. Why in the world will we not want to be together with God's people? I don't get it. I don't understand why we, you know, no, I'm a Christian, but I just can't do people. We're going to spend eternity with people. Just imagine if that's everybody else's thoughts towards you. The gospel would have never been preached to you. I just can't people. I can't people. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. Oh, thank you, Pastor Kenny. Everyone else is like, whoa, that was strong. No, that ain't. That's what that is. That is you separating yourself. Oh, it's just my personality. That's your personality. And, and if it is your personality, don't let your personality get in front of the person of Christ. Yeah, yeah, somebody. Put that personality behind you and say, wait a minute. I've got to be around people. I was watching at the wedding. It was beautiful. My wife and I were looking, and uh, Courtney, was tell they, were they told their story during their ceremony. And I found out this brother was leading worship one day and saw Rose worshiping. And was, I think he said, I love you, Je Jesus. <laughs> I'm finding this all out while I'm standing up there doing this wedding. I'm like, Courtney, I will fight you right now, brother. Tammy and I were sitting back at the table and we were looking and we saw people who found their spouse in church. People who their best friends are they found in church. And we saw that connection, that community and said, my God, this is our people. This is our family. There's something beautiful about gathering at the table of the Lord. Something that we just can't gloss over, friend. And I'm not trying to dog you. I just think you're missing out on so much that God has for you through people. God has people that he wants to bless your life with. But you're so, you're so downtrodden when it comes to your faith in people. And I get that. I get that. But I'd say try again. Because you, maybe you were just at the wrong table. Maybe if you got yourself to the right table, you'll find some fellowship that will really transform and change your life. I've got to go. Let's go to the next one. The next one is we pray at this table. We pray at this table. Let's go back to the text, y'all. This ain't your pastor coming up with this. It says, and a deep sense of all. Rather, I'm sorry. Let me go before that. They gave themselves to teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. We got to pray together. This Sunday, today, from 9 to 9.30 was the first one we've had. It's a prayer gathering. It's going to continue from this point forward. At 9 a.m., if you get here from 9 to 9.30, this place is as quiet as it can be. They've got great worship music playing, and people were just at the altar soaking in the presence of the Lord. Why? Because this place is a house of prayer. That's what Jesus said. He said, you've turned it into a den of thieves. It's a house of prayer. And the house of God ought to be a place where we are constantly looking for people to join us in prayer. Why? Because the scripture says that the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous, what? It avails much. Hey, when you got righteous people praying with you, it makes a difference. I, I thought I was getting way more better response than that. I love being a part of the church because I know that when I get to church on a Sunday, if I've got a dilemma that I need someone to join me in prayer with, there are more than 50, 60 folks in the room that have come together and say, let's go before the throne of grace. Let's talk to our Father about this issue. Prayer! Is what we get at the table. Prayer is what we get at the table. And I love about prayer is that prayer is not just request. Prayer is action. 
So not only do they help me with going with my request before the Lord, but Pastor Mike, what I've had people do for me is help me put my feet to my faith. I've had people help me walk out the next step so I'm not just praying for stuff, but I'm acting on what I'm praying for. Prayer is what we do at the table of the Lord. The church is not a country club. It is not, it's not here so you can sell your business. I know some of you come from some church backgrounds where that's all they did. I'm just trying to tell you we've got it wrong for a long time. The church has made a mess of being the church. This is the table of the Lord. We are here for his glory, not our own glory. We are here for the building of his kingdom, not our own personal kingdom. I'm sorry. I just had to put that out there. So important for us to get that. It is a place of prayer. The table is a place of prayer. Here's the next one. You ready? I'm almost done. Y'all, we getting out here early. Hallelujah. We worship at this table. We worship at this table. Y'all ready? Let's look at what I mean by worship. I want to fix this worship idea. A deep sense of awe. A deep sense. That's worship. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many great signs and wonders. We need to bring the awe back into our worship. And I love, we have great music at this church. We've always had great music at this church. God has been, just a, he's been so good to us in the form of worship and music. He's given us, just over the years, talented people come and they go and, and they're, we're, every season God has sent somebody to just lead us into his presence. Great stuff, but that's not worship. That's song service. I'm trying again. We're like, what do you mean that's not worship? That is a form of worship, but that's not worship itself. That, did y'all hear me? That is a form of worship, but that's not worship itself. Worship is your lifestyle. Worship is the way we live. Worship is the way we love. Worship is the way we sit at the table. Worship is the way we treat other people at the table. Worship goes so much far beyond what we sing. And I'm, 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 I'm afraid that in much of the church that the songs have become the worship. That's why we can only get it when the song that we like is sung on a Sunday. That's why churches can't cross. Jesus, help me. I said I wasn't going here. That's why black folk can't worship with white folk and Spanish folk can't worship with black folk because we worship our music over our God. And if your style, help me, God. So I got to stay here. This was killing the church. Your style ain't my style. And because my style ain't your style and because we're so wrapped up in our styles that none of us will give up our style to have unity in the body. Let me tell you, when this church started, it was hand clap, hand clapping, foot stomping. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. Stop. Don't play with me. I will have church right now. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Come on. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Stop. Stop. Some of you are like, I can feel him. You should have been able to feel him earlier. We're so married to our preferences. Then as this church started transitioning, I said, wait a minute. That's where I came from. I could rock out like that every Sunday. Get that bass and that Hammond boost screaming. I will preach the paint off the walls here. But when God called us and said, hey, I want you to do something multicultural, some of that had to be given up. That's why some of y'all are struggling right now. You hate it where you were, but you're struggling with where you are because it doesn't sound and feel like where you were. But maybe the bondage of where you were is because they wouldn't let go of their song so that another generation could sing. I'm preaching good now. You see, every generation has its own giant. And David couldn't use Saul's armor to fight his giant. And if we're not willing to give up our armor so the next generation can knock down their Goliath, we're always going to have a problem. 
Stop. We worship at this table. <laughs> we worship at this table. <laughs> Had to bring them all in. I'm like, <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> okay. We worship at this table, but worship isn't a style. Worship is a posture of the heart. It is a lifestyle. It's everything that we do. And you're going to get there. It's like, I love the church. I just don't like the worship. I'm like, <laughs> that response alone tells me what your understanding of worship is. And I love, I love, and this is not just an age thing. This could be a culture thing. I love many of you saints who have said, you know what? I will deal with it being different because I want what God has. I love it. And I'm telling you, and I'm not going to act like I had never lived in the tension. I've lived in the tension because I like what I came from. Like, we have church. You know, one of the sisters got to running last night. I was like, I'm about to run with her. I'm looking at my Baptist people. I'm like, okay, calm down, folks. We're good. We're good. And I look on the corner. We got a Baptocostal because you got some Baptists that are Baptocostal. Some of y'all, see, it's a mess in this place. I don't know what to do on Sundays. <laughs> I love this table. Okay, we worship at the table. Here's the next one. We share at this table. This is a good table, man. Let's go to the scriptures. It says, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions, shared the money with those in need. They shared their, their, they shared their possessions. They took care of one another. You know, one of the community I admire in, this commu in, in our community is the Mennonite and the Amish community. I've read many books about them. And one of the reasons is I love that they're so community focused. It takes us 37 years and $8.7 million to build a barn. <laughs> Ladies, I've seen my Amish sisters, my Mennonite sisters, They'd be out. I'll be telling my wife, like, babe, look at her. <laughs> Come on, brothers. <laughs> you ain't been driving through the, through the back roads and like, she, don't, she got like three horses and you, you don't even want to cut the grass. <laughs> Girl, look at her. Look at my, look at my sister over there. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not the message. I don't know why I went there. <laughs> I love it. Let me tell you this. They stick together. They, they, they understand the table. They say, we're going to share. What do you need? Whatever you need, we're going to support you. They build businesses together. They build communities together. They do it together. You know why they can do it? Because they have this shared value. But it isn't about me. It isn't about me. Come on, church. If we would ever get to the place where we would stop making it about us, Personally, it's about what I can get and what I can have. Imagine the needs we can meet. I, I dream of a church. I dream of a church that is so entrenched in biblical community that every need is met, that we become the envy of the community. That people start looking and saying, how is it that every one of their families is blessed? How is it that their businesses are blessed? How is it that their marriages are blessed? How is it that their children are blessed? Well, look at them. Nobody goes without in that community. That's, that's, I'm telling you, that's my heart's dream. But it only happens when we have this table manner, and that is that we share at this table. They were selling their possessions and their extra land to see to it that every need is met. I've shared this before, but I don't know how long it's been, and some of y'all are so new, we need to hear it again. Here's my dream, that we would have no mortgage at this church ever. When it's paid off, you know what I want to do? I want to buy homes, give them away. Yeah. Buy homes, give them away. Uh, it ain't your vision anyhow. Leave me alone. I want to buy homes. People got the nerve to be worried about my vision. Leave me alone. <laughs> buy homes, give them away. Build entire communities. Never take on extra debt because we need, because your pastor drives a 2011 Chevy Traverse. Just in case you're like, well, what does the pastor drive? Not what you drive. I saw you come in this parking lot. <laughs> Leave me alone. My cards are paid off. They don't look as nice, but I don't got no monthly payment. 
Somebody say amen. amen. Freedom. I'm going to say that my transmission's going to blow out. I'm going to have a payment next week. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Help me, Lord. <laughs> but why am I saying this? Imagine if, we, imagine if we had that kind of financial freedom. Imagine when the, the local school districts are in need of, of, of budgeting or finances to put a teacher that's needed in a school. And the church is just like, oh, we got that. We'll take care of that for the year. Like who? The church? Yeah, we're going to pay her entire salary for the whole year. Why? Because that's what we do. We're the church. And we make impact in our community. We change where we're at. But that doesn't happen until we get the shared value, this table manner, where everyone comes to the table. You see, because here's what happens in the church. If you don't know, statistically, only 10 to 15% of the people in the church pay the bills and do the serving. That's not my thing. That's Barna. Barna is a group that does nothing but studies on the church. And they tell us you got 15. It was 20% before COVID. I think it's between 10 and 15 now. Between 10 and 15% of the people give the money and serve the church. That means this isn't a shared value. We're at the table and only 10% are participating the way we're supposed to be participating. It got quiet up in this church. <laughs> Let me move on. Last one. Here it is. We make room at this table for others. We make room. This ain't that church. Wait, this is my seat. I don't know why they sat there. They know I sit there every Sunday. <laughs> this ain't your seat. See, some of y'all are still so caught up on where you've been. And while you say you hated it, you're still, you're still married to it. You're like the children of Israel. They left Egypt and still wanted to be there. And you come to church where it's no longer about your seats and your titles. And then all of a sudden, someone takes your seat. And all that that's in your heart is tested. Well, that's my seat. I, well, she knows I sit there. Well, yeah, someone was sitting in her normal seat. Why am I driving this? Preferences kill churches more than anything. Nothing adds, a, adds, adds drama to the table like a preference, a person who will let their preference go before other people. Yeah. See, this value right here says we make room at the table. That means this, I'm willing to be uncomfortable so you have a seat. Yeah. You ever been at a table like that? Where the, you're at a restaurant and they can't fit all of y'all, so one person has a chair it's on the corner right there. They keep poking themselves in the belly. Y'all ain't never been nowhere. <laughs> but we're not about to have you sit on a table by yourself. We'll make room at this table because one thing I know about God is there's always room at the table. Here's my last one. Last thing I want to say to you. Come help me. Just give me something real soft. Here's what I want you to say. Your, here's my quote. Y'all get this. Your fellowship determines your discipleship. The tables you sit at matter. I'm going to say this, and I've never said this because I don't think Journey Church is the only church. We got incredible churches. I can name a few that we partner with, and you're just great people. Folks over at the worship center, I love Pastor Matt. Love Pastor Matt. Incredible group of believers there. Pastor Jose Jimenez, Activate Church in the city. I mean, I could go, I could name churches. The churches even in this local community, there are great places. I'm, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when you find a good table, stay there. When you find a good table, stay at the table because your fellowship determines your discipleship. If the table is shallow, that's how, that's how far your discipleship is going. You are going to be the believer in Christ based on the table that you sit at. Nothing will impact you more than that table that you sit at. You want to get around people who have purpose in their heart to grow into deeper faith in Jesus Christ. Because when you do, it will impact everything.